Hello. Hello. Hello, everybody. So welcome to the eighth week of Edible Ed. So Will is not here this week, but I will start to kick off the class. We do have two wonderful speakers today talking to us about the food system and policy. As well as this week, we still have some beautiful pictures from Will's garden. I can't provide the same exact details that he can, but what I'm thinking, we'll also look out for those beautiful orange flowers. Okay, so how are people feeling today? It's almost a little bit of, uh, a little bit past the middle of the semester. Are people feeling good this way, here? Nothing, I'm seeing some thumbs up. All right, who's kind of overwhelmed by projects and exams right now? Raise your hand. Okay, not that many people who's graduating this year. Woo! Okay, so then gauging just how the class feels. So today we'll have two speakers. We'll have Dr. Christine Madsen, who's here, here with us right now, as well as after the break, we'll have another speaker, Sakina Shabazz, who's part of the Berkeley Food Institute, and will help us understand more about the Farm Bill. So let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Christine Madsen. Hey, how's everybody doing? Okay, ish. Um, how many of you are graduate students? Okay, and how many undergrads? Okay, great. Any community members? Couple. Nice to see everybody. So I have known Will for about 10 years and um, very much uh, consider him a friend and have enjoyed seeing his garden and pictures of his garden. I don't know if, if you guys know, but he sends pictures of his gardens to his friends regularly. So we also get to see what you guys see. Uh, I am gonna talk, I, I teach, I actually have a, a few, Jeffrey, I've got a few students from my Transforming Food Systems class. Viana was actually in my class a couple years ago. I'm not really gonna talk about food systems, so, so well, I'm gonna talk about a narrower aspect of the food system, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about health. So, I love this ad, this is from the 1960s. Sugar can be the willpower you need to undereat. So this is an ad by the sugar industry. Actually, I think they were called the Sugar Association at the time. And the little text up top says, enjoy an ice cream cone shortly before lunch. So I just, it's just a little thing that drives me crazy and I find super funny because what about this has anything to do with an optimal diet, right? Their, their trick is eat a little ice cream before lunch and then you won't eat as much at lunch. Anyway, okay, we're gonna come back to sugar, but I just, I love finding old ads that seem somewhat ridiculous. Um, my roots, so this is my dad. He was born in Fresno. Um, he grew up on a few different farms in Fresno. His dad was actually a sharecropper. Uh, he moved to San Francisco after he went into the Navy and I was born in San Francisco. I grew up south of San Francisco uh, and went to um, a junior college for a couple of years, Kenyatta College in Redwood City. Anybody, any, any two-year junior college people in the room? Okay, California has an amazing educational system. The fact that we have junior colleges is pretty astounding. Anyway, I took advantage of that, as did my brothers, and then I, I came to Berkeley. So I'm a Berkeley alum, and I did a major in English and math. Uh, I couldn't decide exactly what I wanted to do at the time, so I double majored in those two very different subjects. And then I went into the Peace Corps directly after undergrad in Africa, and I taught math. Um, and it was really when I came back from the Peace Corps that things started to gel. Re-entry for anybody who's been in the Peace Corps, actually, anybody, any peace, any re, our PCVs, re, return Peace Corps volunteers? I know our undergrads haven't had a chance yet, but. So it's a pretty shocking thing to come back to this country after being in a place. I, the village that I lived in was a small village. It was in the Central African Republic, which is a small country, um, and there was no electricity or running water. So coming back here, I, felt pretty um, surprising. <laughs> we have so much stuff, right? We have so much stuff in America, so much just material things around everywhere. And that's, I didn't know that that wasn't the way most of the world lived because I'd grown up in a pretty provincial way um, in a pretty middle-class neighborhood. We had grocery stores with lots of things on the shelves and I just kind of assumed that's, that's what it is. 
So then I'm in a country where my mom sent me a, tooth, a box with toothpaste in it to, to Africa while I was in the Peace Corps. And I throw my little box from the toothpaste container into the ditch, which is trash there. There's no, like, we have people who come and haul away our trash. It does, that kind of thing doesn't exist in so many places still. So I, the next day I see that my, my little toothpaste box is now a car that a little kid has stuck sticks through and kind of created wheels for and is folding around because you know they didn't have boxes. Now, to be fair, this was many years ago and I think that even in that village, which I haven't been to for a long time, has probably changed. But I, coming back, was like shocked at how much we have and at the disparities and who has what. And one of the most shocking things for me was in the healthcare system, because where in this little village in Grimari, um, in the Central African Republic, the hospital, and this, while a, while a small village, it was actually one of the largest villages in the country, and their hospital was a cement building with metal tables, <coughs> right? There was no electricity, so they didn't have refrigerators, they couldn't have medicine, they couldn't run equipment. So what it meant to have a hospital was a very safe facility that was solid, because almost all the other buildings in the village were, were mud brick. And again, things may have changed, but what hasn't changed is that what we have in the United States and what we do with our medical dollars is crazy <coughs> when you think about all the people who can't afford basic medical care, right? So I decided, okay, well, this is what I want to do. I want to go into med school and I'm gonna kind of try and address health equity. And that was what set me on the path of trying to actually do something about health equity while, while in medicine. So I'm a pediatrician, um, I'm sitting in clinic, and because I, was, I graduated from med school in 2000, which is before some of you were born, um, but the healthcare was sort of beginning to worry about and recognize that we had something called an obesity epidemic. This is the term that was used, but basically it meant that Americans were getting heavier, which, which we were. And it's not so much about that, it's not about how much people weigh, but what the problem was that we were seeing an increase in diabetes that was going along with that and an increase in cardiovascular disease. So people were dying earlier than they needed to, right? So your quality of life is going down. And of course, what we know, because it's true with almost every illness in the United States, it's driven by economics. So if you have money, you're much less likely to have problems, right? less likely to have health problems. But if you don't have money, you're much more likely to carry the burden of that disease. And so I decided this is how it's gonna play out with this new epidemic, and I, I'll, I'll focus on that. And so while I was in my um, residency, I started doing research, and then when I, I did a fellowship after I finished my training, and my fellowship was really focused on how to create, um, a, you know, how to, how to create greater equity as this obesity epidemic unfolds. So I'm sitting in my clinic, and I've got kids coming in because this is a specialty clinic at UCSF. I was on faculty at UCSF. And this means the local pediatricians are sending their kids to us because the pediatricians and the families are saying, oh, this kid's weight status is not great. I'm worried about what's going to happen over time. So we'll send them to a specialty clinic that's going to fix it. So first of all, these kids are pretty healthy who are coming in, right? Because kids are very resilient. And so yes, maybe their weight status wasn't great, but they're still pretty healthy. They're not gonna be as adults over time. That's the concern, right? It's what's gonna happen as an adult. But I'm not trained for this because the real problem is not medical. The problem was the environment, right? I have kids who, have, who come from lots of different backgrounds. So my families had, some had a lot of extra spending money and some had very little disposable income. But the problem that I had is like, if everybody had money, I'd kind of be fine and I would be happy to leave it where it was if we had a level playing field, but I knew the playing field wasn't level. And so I started to feel really bad that I'm counseling people about what to eat and how to exercise, but not everybody can afford to make the changes that I'm saying that they should make. And this made me begin to feel very uncomfortable because even though that's what I had been taught to do in medical school, I realized this is not gonna solve anybody's problems. So I started, Okay. I started partnering with local organizations who were actually doing things that might help kids be healthier and were free. So one of those organizations happened to be, happens to be a, a, a called, it's America Scores. And interestingly, so it's poets, athletes, leaders. This organization started to try and get kids more engaged in school. So they use poetry to like help kids explore literacy and get excited about reading, and they used soccer as the hook. So I'm looking at this organization, I'm saying, well, maybe kids, you know, 
actually, we, the soccer may make them healthier because they're going to be out doing activity. And I loved focusing on physical activity. And most of my early research was around how to promote physical activity. So we didn't have to talk about weight. Just be fit. We don't have to even talk about weight. This actually felt really good. In fact, my first NIH grant was to explore the efficacy of this program over time. And I loved being able to help organizations like this, like Playworks, other national organizations, demonstrate their effectiveness with respect to health, because that means that their funders are going to be you know, giving them more money. And that's great. But I, I began still, after another few years, to feel like the problem is, though, I'm not doing anything upstream. So we'll talk, right, systems thinking is one of the big pieces of the course. So as, as, in the systems thinking perspective, I'm not changing the environment at all. The system is spitting out sick kids. These sick kids, well, not necessarily sick yet, but they will be, are showing up in my clinic, and I'm just waiting for them to get to me. Like, I'm not moving upstream to, to halt the progress of that system that's spitting them out. It's like this machine, right, churning out kids who are going to become sick. So I decided, well, all right, I don't think that, I don't think that this is going to make me, um, I kind of felt like a fraud, saying I'm you know, this doctor who's supposed to do no harm and do, and do good. And I don't think that the way that I'm working on this epidemic is actually helpful. So I think I want to try and work upstream and began to think about policies. And at that point, I left medicine at UCSF and came over here. And I'm you know, faculty in our School of Public Health here at Berkeley. So policies, I'm going to return to sugar for just a second. So, and I just, I just now realized I have a monitor here, so I don't have to keep turning around and looking behind me. Ta-da. So um, this is US sugar consumption per capita over more than 200 years, starting in 1820. And you can see that there's been a dramatic increase over time, sugar consumption. Um, so an important note, uh, very related to health, is that this actually represents colonization, right, and slavery, because that's how we got most of our sugar over time, which is problematic from a societal perspective. And there's other implications. I'm sure many of you know that high sugar consumption is also related to diabetes and to heart disease. And so we see as your, as your sugar intake goes up, your risk of dying early um, from either diabetes or heart disease uh, increases dramatically as well. So when we look at how we get added sugars in our diet in the United States, the number one source is sugary drinks. So soda, sports drinks, teas, coffees that are pre-sweetened. That's where most of the added sugars in the American diets show up. And as I was beginning to look at sort of added sugars and diet policies that might be related to our diet and how to make our diets healthier, I came across this graph in a trade magazine from the American Beverage Association. And I, you know, it's really interesting because it's going from 1997, no, 1987 to 2015. And from a health perspective, it actually looks like it's, it's good news, right? It, it, consumption was going up, and then it's coming down. Um, from a sales perspective, from the American Beverage Association, they're not so happy about that. They'd rather continue to sell, sell, sell. But I knew from reading other, you know, from published papers, that this doesn't tell the whole story, and that we actually need a little more context. Because people began to use this saying, we don't need to worry about sugar-sweetened beverages. It's fine. People can just drink as much as they want because it's already declining. But the truth is that you have to go back to when sugary beverages actually were kind of first on the market. And so if you look back in 1950, you can see that people on average, the average person was drinking 10 gallons per person per year of soft drinks. My guess is that people in here probably I won't make people raise their hands, but my guess is that people probably don't drink much sweetened cola. Maybe some of you do. That's fine. Everything in moderation. But what this means is if the average person was drinking 10 gallons per person per year, and we know a lot of people weren't drinking any, there are some people who were drinking a lot. But this number skyrocketed to 50 gallons per person per year around 2000. And then it settled back at about 40 gallons per person <coughs> as of 2015. And I think it's, it's been pretty stable since then. I, don't have, I haven't updated the graph, but it hasn't changed much. And so this, interestingly, is sort of mirrored by trends in diabetes, right? And there have been many, many studies that have linked sugar-sweetened beverage consumption to diabetes. So this is concerning from a health perspective, and certainly from an equity perspective, because we know there's a lot of targeted marketing 
in lower income communities and to communities of color by the American Beverage Association, well by, I shouldn't say by them, but by multiple companies who sell beverages. So here's a question for you. Oh, well also, okay, healthcare costs of diabetes in the United States, 330 billion a year is what we pay in caring for people with diabetes. So I'm gonna ask, I'm, I'm hoping that you'll, people will be willing to sort of shout out their thoughts about this, but you saw this graph, right? Um, this increase over time in consumption. I'm not so, not so much about what's been happening recently for the decrease, but what do you think led to that increase, um, a, a five, you know, five-fold increase over 50 years? What kinds of things might have contributed to rapidly increasing consumption? Yes, Jeffrey. Price. price. And tell me a little bit more what you mean by price. Okay, so the price of sugary drinks can often be less expensive than the price of water. And do you think that that's a new phenomenon or has that kind of always been the case? <clears throat> Depends on where it is. Certainly by country, prices differ a lot, but it is absolutely true that water in many places costs more than, um, bottled water costs more than bottled soda. That's a problem. What else? Okay, so price. Price might have led to an increase, yeah. Advertisement, okay. More advertisement over time. Anything else? Price, advertisement. What else might lead to increases in consumption? Anybody can think about changes in the food system that might, Diana? So how bad they are for your body? Oh, like that would lead to a decline then in consumption or? Oh, okay, because people didn't know how bad it was or? Okay, could be, sexy, yeah. I mean sexy, the advertising thing definitely gets it sexy, yeah. Okay, absolutely, ubiquity. Ubiquity, they're everywhere, for sure. Anything else? Yeah. That wasn't always there. Right, Will showed that huge graph, right, of the increase, yep, absolutely. <laughs> so one, increase in going to restaurants where they sell them at all, and two, I'm gonna give you two points for that. Two, because this, the all you can drink is crazy too. Right, And this is true that a lot of restaurants do all you can drink and they don't wanna stop because it costs them almost nothing, right? It costs so little, it's really, really cheap for restaurants who have fountain drinks to, to dispense those. Any, anything else? Oh. Yeah. One of the studies that we did actually looked at addiction among teenagers who were drinking soda, and we demonstrated that if you try to take them off, they show symptoms of addiction. So, I mean, how many of you are coffee? Like, what happens if you don't drink your coffee? Seriously. But soda has, the, like, a lot of these kids were drinking the equivalent amount of caffeine and sodas. So there was that, and there was also just their cravings went up. So absolutely, that could be part of it, too. Anything else? There's one more thing that we, that we haven't mentioned. I'll just, okay, so the other issue is packaging. So packaging, right, the size of those drinks, where they're sold, the ubiquity, like they're everywhere, they're in restaurants, they're in other places too, but also packaging. So it started in soda fountains, I think Francesca said that. That's the only place you could get it. You went to either a pharmacy or a, an ice cream parlor or whatever, and back in 1886, Coca-Cola sold their first drinks in Atlanta, Georgia, in a little soda fountain parlor place. In 1892, they released their glass bottle it was six and a half ounces. Just tiny, tiny bottle. A couple years later, they introduce a six pack, right? So it's still six and a half ounce bottles, but what does this allow people to do? You can carry more, right? Literally, you can actually carry out six as opposed to being able to carry a couple bottles. So it just makes it more convenient. How smart are they? 1955, they introduce larger sizes. Most of this is Coke up to this point, um, although, um, I actually, I don't even, okay. Most, I think that these numbers are from Coke. They introduced two king size values, a 10 ounce and a 12 ounce, and then they introduce a family size that's 26 ounces. 
1960, the steel can gets introduced, which means your product's not gonna break if you drop it, right? So this is another innovation. And then in 1980 and 1989, we've gotta love Big Gulp. I didn't even put up, they had a huge gulp that was 128 ounces, which is insane, I think that's a gallon. That was, they actually had, I don't think that people, I don't think they really sold that that often. I think it was probably just for, you know, show. They do a lot of things for show. But that's crazy, right, how much you can drink now. And then this is another really important innovation, the plastic bottle, because it's much cheaper for them to produce, right? Way cheaper to produce. And um, advertising, absolutely. One of the important things about this, like look at that, the kind of advertising that they do too. Those are people that a lot of young people want to be, right? They're all the top of their game, whether they're stars or you know, musicians or, or uh, athletes, and they look really happy. And advertisements say things like love, like for the love of it and, and uh, uh, choose happiness, right? So they're not just selling a product, they're selling a way of life, they're selling feelings. And then when we try and sort of create better information, more complete information for the consumer. On the public health side, what kinds of things do we do on the public health side to counter this type of advertising that really makes you, I mean, you think you're going to be beautiful if you drink their drinks, right? You're going to have love and friendship. So what, what do we do to counter that in public health? Or what have kind of traditionally have we been able to do? Does anybody have a, any, any packaged product right now? You guys are so healthy. You've all got your water bottles and your homemade food. Because what I, no. Yeah, right. So, so what, what we do to counter this, okay, these are all type one, fast thinking. Like, it, this is all instinctive, making me feel good. We counter it with a nice little package on the back of a, like a nice little label on the back of a package that has nutritional information that most of us don't understand, right? So we don't have an effective way of combating this. So there's a lot of information coming at people encouraging them to, in this case, drink sugary drinks. But it's not just sugary drinks, right? Almost all processed food has very sexy advertising. And this, I just want you to sort of look at those green bars and the red bars because this is the, inter and this gets back to the point about pricing, right? So those, gr those red bars is when high fructose corn syrup came onto the market. So what you're looking at are trends in calories, essentially, sold as either sugar, cane and beet sugar, or high fructose corn syrup. So high fructose corn syrup now is about half of the sweeteners that people consume. And it went from zero to 50% very quickly. And that's because corn is a really economical way to make sweeteners. So why is it that corn is so much more efficient or economical compared to sugar. Does anybody have ideas about why that might be? We're gonna talk about it um, when, when Sakina comes. Subsidized. subsidized, and how is it subsidized? Right. So specifically subsidized through the farm bill, right? Yeah, is that what you were gonna suggest as well? Yeah. Right. So we have lots of, right, depending on um, the, the climate, uh, in the United States, it's far easier to grow corn subsidies. And then the other thing is that sugar, beet sugar and cane sugar, had high taxes that we had put on them. We had federal taxes, bigger taxes on imports, again, harder to grow here. Um, but note that the subsidies for corn and the taxes for sugar that created this very different structure in pricing is all things that we get to decide. We decide what we're gonna tax and what we're gonna actually subsidize, right? So this is an artificial difference in price that made high fructose corn syrup a great way to sell way more product, right? Because they could actually literally decrease the price relative to other things. And it's still true that healthy food costs more than junk food. Lots of studies have demonstrated that it's about twice as expensive to exist on healthy food as it is to exist on, on junk food. So here's what, okay, I'm gonna ask you to get with a neighbor and I want you to take, we're gonna take three minutes. 
I'll get my, I'll get my, I'll get my phone in a second. I'll, I'll actually really time us. But I want you to just talk about a few ways that we could reduce added sugars in the diet. Just brainstorm a few different ways. Maybe it's things you've already seen that we're doing. Maybe it's new ideas you'd like to try out. It could be policies, they could be other approaches, other vehicles for kind of creating change, but just come up with a couple of different ways, a few different ways that we could reduce added sugars in the US diet. Does that make sense? And then we'll come back and we'll have a little framework and we'll discuss. So you guys can decide between, among you when you talk who's gonna give me ideas. But maybe try and get like 10 different approaches and we're just gonna try and do a little organizing exercise with those. Okay, take three minutes, talk amongst yourselves. I, <clears throat> sorry, can you everyone hear me? Uh, so we were thinking about uh, just different methods. So there's like sort of the behavioral modifications where you could possibly try to avoid processed foods. That should help a lot. Um, and then from sort of like an institutional policy side, uh, a lot of universities have banned like sodas. I know Berkeley has the pour out Pepsi. Uh, we mentioned that that's like an institutional change that could support uh, the reduction of the sugars. Um, and then under normal circumstances, you could potentially tax like behaviors you don't want to promote, like tobacco and sugar. Um, but there are complications to that. Um, and that's sort of, I think that was it. OK, so taxes, an institutional ban, taxes, behavioral change, which I would say um, I'm just going to throw that over here under who. Okay, let's hear, let's hear others. Over here. Um, to your left. <laughs> <laughs> in a lot of Latin American countries, they have labels on packaging that say high in calories, high in fat, and high in salt. So even if it's something as simple as if it has added sugar, it needs to have like a very clear label on the front of the packaging that states that. Okay, excellent. Labeling, front of package labeling you mentioned. Yeah, we kind of just spoke to the same idea of like labeling and how oftentimes it is very hard for a person to like understand, you know, all these different components to it. So just like the simplification of understanding it, um, I think goes a long way. But I mean, okay. that's kind of hard to say because you're like, how do you go about changing that whole thing for like more people to understand that? We'll talk about that actually too. We're going to talk, I have a couple slides about that. Maybe an additional point on sort of basic education around basic cooking skills. I think one thing that came to mind is something like tomato sauce is really cheap and really easy to make, but a processed version is actually often more expensive and contains heaps of sugar. Okay, so educate, education like around cooking and the health of various foods. Anybody else? Anything you think is important? We talked about doing the inverse of the, the timeline that you showed us, making it harder for ah. people like Okay. <laughs> making like smaller bottles or like massively huge bottles that people wouldn't want to carry around. Great. Um, and similarly, like making it less accessible in places like schools potentially. Okay, so smaller portion sizes and then decrease accessibility, decrease access in certain places. That's kind of like institutional ban or other, you know, okay, limit access. Anybody else? Which one, one back there. <coughs> um, so I, I, uh, we were kind of talking about how PepsiCo and Coca-Cola are a big, like a duopoly in terms of like the whole like snack industry. So I feel like if anything were to really change, it would come from kind of like breaking that up and giving those companies an incentive to reduce added, added sugars so that even regardless of whether people are educated in terms of like the amount of sugars that are in their, in their food, um, they, the bigger companies would need a reason for them to no longer use those added sugars. 
That's, that's, that's kind of huge, right? I mean, we could just actually try to get rid of the oligopoly that is Pepsi and Coke, because between Pepsi, Coke, Dr. Pepper, there's, they own 81% of the market. Just the three of them own 81% of the market, which is pretty, pretty astounding, and actually means we have almost no competition, right? Pepsi has bought up so many different drinks, you can't even look Coke, they've all, anyway, they, okay, enough of that. Did you wanna just, yeah, and then we'll close there and, and move on to the next, but. Um, we talked about nutrition labeling, and earlier in class, um, one of the guest speakers mentioned how um, even though sugar is like the highest, like m most prevalent ingredient in foods, it's like split up across different ingredients. And so like forcing companies to conglomerate all their sugar into like one ingredient, and you'll see that it rises to the top most of the time. Yeah, right. Because they do, they hide it under all these different, right, names. So that's, that's also kind of about, that's sort of truth in labeling, right? That's what you're saying, it's also related to labeling. Okay, okay, this is, this is great. So one of the things that I wanted to have you guys think about was who's directly affected by these policies and who's indirectly affected, who's, who's affected, either directly or indirectly. So when we talk about education, we know that we're talking about the individual, right? That the direct person you're trying to affect is an individual and you want to affect their behavior change, right? Does that touch the system? So it can touch demand, right? Because we absolutely have amazing power in choosing what we choose. But it's pretty hard with just that little bit of education to go up against like the sexy, sexy advertising that's coming in. So thinking about who's affected is really important. So education is gonna be the individual. What about um, institutional bans? Who's affected? I mean, it's. This is getting at a system level, right? Because it's no longer available in a particular setting. The most likely institutions to ban are healthcare institutions, right? Big ban happened at UCSF. It's the only UC campus that does not have undergraduate students, and it is the only all health campus. It's all they do, they teach health. Dentistry, medicine, pharmacy, nursing. So this is actually getting at a larger organization. So we'll say this is getting an organization. It's not getting yet at the producer, but it's getting at the organization. Who's affected by a tax? What's that? So it, consumers are, are gonna be affected by a tax, but whether or not they're affected directly depends on the structure of the tax. So I wanna move on to just, um, I, I want you guys to think though, in terms of like framework, an organizing framework, who's affected directly and indirectly, what's the mechanism, that's kind of, those are the policies that you're coming up with, and then who would support and oppose based on who's affected and the mechanism. So if we look at soda taxes as an example of how you structure, how you can structure a tax, Berkeley was the first city in the nation to pass, to pass a soda tax. It had been tried before, had not been successful, and it was a grassroots effort led by a coalition of um, people in schools, um, healthcare community, and people in, um, I think Healthy Black Families was one of the big leads on it, because they were saying, I'm tired of my, my people being uh, targeted by all of this marketing. So it was a coalition, this is kind of going back to what Saru was saying, if you're actually, if the coalition involves the people who are affected, you're far more likely to be successful. And they were targeting Big Soda directly. So this, um, by the way, lots of countries, the US isn't even close, but lots of countries have passed soda taxes. But the structure of a tax, how an excise tax works, because all of our taxes in the United States, Berkeley was the first in the nation to pass, um, six other cities have also passed those taxes. We have, we have seven right now. But the tax is levied on distributors. It's, it's the distributor who pays it, which may be Coke or Pepsi directly if they are distributing their own product or the company who's buying from them and distributing. So they're paying it directly to the jurisdiction. In the United States, that means they pay, pay it directly to cities. The distributors do raise the price to retailers. Retailers then raise the price to consumers. Consumers see the, the raised price and they do buy less. We know this, this has been shown across multiple jurisdictions now, multiple levels of geography, this is how they work. And they're highly effective in reducing consumption. But more importantly, from my perspective, they're highly effective at bringing some of the externalities associated with drinking sugar, sugary beverages, into the production of, uh, into the costs that are incurred in running a normal business, right? 
So the problem right now, I said there's $330 billion that we spend every year on diabetes. 10% of that is thought to be directly related to sugar sweetened beverage consumption. There, I should probably put slides up with citing studies. But so that means $30 billion a year is directly related to, uh, in healthcare costs is related to drinking sugar sweetened beverages. But the corporations who are making those beverages don't pay anything. And that's, again, it's like what we price sugar at versus high fructose corn syrup. That's a decision we get to make, right? We either say, we're going to say that you need to bundle that cost into the cost of making your product, you know, include it as one of the costs of making your product, or we say, don't worry about it, you don't have to do that. And what's really important is that don't be confused um, by excise tax versus sales tax. I want, one of the things you should all walk away with is knowing the difference between an excise tax, which is trying to hold the maker accountable for cost of their product. We call them externalities if they're not having to pay for them and we can internalize those through mechanisms like a tax. In a sales tax, by, okay, so if, anyway, we hope for healthier communities with these. That's a longer term thing that many people are studying right now to actually see how that, how that works. But how a sales tax works, the distributor is not involved at all, right? They don't have to pay anything. They're not touched by it, which means no money goes directly to the city through the distributor. Retailers <coughs> don't have to touch it either doesn't raise the price, which means that consumers don't see an increased price because it happens after the fact on their receipt. It's just an added tax to the receipt. So it doesn't change people's behavior. So if your point is, I want bigger revenues to the city, because I will tell you that soda ta excise taxes are about 10 to 20 times as large, typically, as, um, as sales taxes, because it's much harder to add a big sales tax on. So if what you're really going for is more money into the community so that the community can actually create better programs, have better infrastructure, you're far better off with an excise tax. And most importantly, it's holding the seller accountable for the you know, harms of its products. Or the costs. I won't even say harms, just the costs. Um, OK, so here's another thing. What other externalities, right, costs of a particular product that are not borne by the company making the product, what other externalities might be associated with sugary drinks? So we've talked about health. I keep talking about diabetes. Lots of other health harms too. The increased risk of cancer, increased risk of bone disease, increased risk of dental caries, yeah. Plastic, huge. Who are the top three plastic polluters in the world? Coke? Pepsi and Nestle, right? They don't pay anything right now for their pollution, for their plastic pollution, nothing. We decided that's fine, right? We all know that, we know, all know that's not fine. And it's really hard. It's really hard to hold them accountable, but we certainly can. We certainly can, and one way to do it would be excise taxes, right? Okay, so plastics are, is one thing. What else might be? And by the way, those plastic costs, the estimates of what plastic pollution costs every year in this uh, globally, $100 billion, including healthcare costs, like our exposure to phthalates, our exposure to plastics, marine life exposure, the loss of marine life, right? Pollution of waterways. Okay, so lots of problems there. What, um, any other externalities that we might, if we're saying, hey, could you actually cover the costs of the things that your product is, is producing? What else were you thinking? Right, carbon emissions, right? And the lack of a carbon sink, because every time you take away forest in order to grow corn, you're increasing your carbon emissions because you no longer have these forests that are actually doing all this great work for us. So environmental, and then also, what about anybody, anybody else? Anybody got a couple, because there's two more that I, I can think of. Water. Huge, right? So we were talking about the price of um, soda being higher than the price of water, right? How is it that they're able to get water, fresh water that they don't have to pay for, right? Because anyway, there's water rights are actually a very complicated system, particularly in California, but federally as well. And they have figured out how to game that system too. So it's not that I, it's not that I don't mean to vilify Coke and Pepsi. We're not holding them accountable for those things. All we have to do is start holding them accountable. I will say it is, it is very difficult, and we know, oh, front of package labels. 
Um, we know that it's hard. I don't know if any of you read, I think you were supposed to read something that I'd written about taxes and preemption. So the big problem for us, Berkeley set a chain reaction in action that was so exciting to see. Berkeley passed a tax in 2016, and by 2018, we had six new cities who had taxes. And then we had other cities in California that were super excited to pass taxes as well. In fact, we had been going around and talking to communities to say, here, let me show you what we've done here. See if you think this would work. We were going into grassroots organizations that were working on health equity in the Central Valley to say, you could do this. Here's how it's done. You can decide how would you want to use those revenues? How would you want to share those out? Is, is this a good fit for your community? And then boom, the American Beverage Association actually made it impossible for any, any city in California to pass a tax until 2030. And it's called preemption. It's when you make sure that locally a tax cannot be passed. There's lots of things you can do with preemption, but that's one of the things that they can do. I will say it's very complicated in California because the way that we pass taxes, unlike most other states, is only through ballot measures. That was Prop 13 back in the 1970s that, for many reasons, that um, has, has perhaps been a good thing. But if we want to add a new tax, it has to pass by 50% vote in the population. And the beverage industry basically said, we're going to make it so you have to pass it by two-thirds vote which is almost impossible to do to get everybody in this country to agree on anything, like a tax. But we're going to make it so it's really, really hard to pass. And so everybody kind of backed off, the legislators backed off, and allowed them this preemption bill. Not only did they say you can't do any new local soda taxes, they actually wrote something in there saying, you can't tax the packaging of grocery items. What does that mean? It means you can't tax plastic bottles. Right, you can't put, it. they're so smart, like they're already thinking about the next battle that's coming. They're past soda taxes, they're already realizing the next battle that has to come is holding them accountable for pollution as well, right, for plastic pollution. So when we think about um, other ways to do it, you guys mentioned front of package labeling. I just want to talk really quickly, I'm going to touch on this and then we're going to give you guys your break. So this is a map, this great, um, the UNC School of Public Health Gillings, they have this great global food policy program and they have these lovely maps. This one is looking at front of package labeling. You can see that countries that have mandatory, which is the pink one, and then voluntary, which is kind of the orange one. But what's important is look at all the different types of labels that are up there. They're showing you those pictures. Those are the labels that are used in those countries. So I want you to just look at this. I, I label these A, B, and C. It doesn't matter. But I just these are three different examples. So we've got this nutritional content slide with the RDAs, the recommended daily allowance. The fact that I just said RDA is already a problem, right? Because who knows what that even means. And then Nutri-Score, which is a well-known one that's used a lot in Europe. And then this one down here, high in sugar, high in fats, high in saturated fats. So which of these do you think you would need the most knowledge in order to interpret? How many would say you need the most knowledge to interpret A? Yeah. How many of you think that if we're going to ask the food industry which one they'd like, how many of you think that they would like A? How many would like B? Food industry, okay, a couple. How many of them would like C? Yeah, food industry doesn't Food industry doesn't like it if it's much more obvious what we're trying to do. And then secondly, in terms of structuring policy, look at, this is from Chile, the one on the left. Um, oh, a little grainy, but anyway. You can see the package, the size of the package there. You can see that that's about 20% of the size of the package. The warning label itself is about 20% of the size of the package. This is, I think, Canada. Their Nutri <laughs> You see the Nutri-Score label over there, which is like point can you even see where it is? I think there may be a, whoops, sorry, I just switched out. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay, I was going to close out anyway. Um, but you get the idea, right? That depending on how you write that policy, so whether it's, it's a really obvious, this is high in fat, high in sugar. I don't need to know how, what percent it's supposed to be of my diet. And then how, how visible is it? How obvious is it when you look at it? So I think the, oh, you did it. That's awesome. I can just go through. I just, I want to just, I'm going to go skip to, to takeaways. Um, 
So what, I, what I'm hoping that you kind of take away from this is, uh, one, we need a whole bunch of different approaches simultaneously, right? No one thing is gonna suddenly make us have a healthier food system. These are all also working within the existing system, which is not necessarily the best way to do it. It's more likely to lead to incremental change. But if you're gonna work within the system, these are things to do. Um, oops, that's the one. Taxes can internalize costs, right, so that producers actually pay for them. That's an important reason that we have excise taxes, but not sales taxes. Excise taxes do that, not sales taxes. Small wins can spread. That's what happened in Berkeley. Clearly, it was making the beverage industry very nervous, which is why they responded the way they did. By the way, that preemption, that preemption bill is um, currently in litigation, which is great news. So it may actually be repealed. And then lastly, organizing has to happen for policy to increase equity. So stakeholders have to be involved in these kinds of policies, particularly things like taxes, or we're not likely to get very equitable change, right? So I think Saru, I mean, who's just, I love Saru, she's so amazing, and she keeps talking about how you ha it has to be, it has to come from the ground up, that's really critical. It can't be our idea about how to fix a system that, for me, as a, you know, an educated white woman, I'm, right, implicated in, the, in busting it, so somebody else is gonna have to help me fix that, and I need to listen to other people in doing that. All right, with that, I will um, have everybody take a break, yeah? Okay, great. Hello everybody, welcome back from your break. So let's give a warm welcome to our next speaker, Sakina. Am I good to go? Oh my gosh, wow. Um, good evening, I'm Sakina Shabazz. I'm the policy director at the Berkeley Food Institute. Dr. Madsen used to be one of our faculty directors, which I think is really fancy. Um, some of you are enrolled in the Untangling the Farm Bill seminar, so it's really nice to see you all. Um, and with that, I'll jump into our time together this evening. I'm going to talk a little bit about BFI, even though I think you guys have already met um, our executive director, Nina Ichikawa, who talked a little bit about BFI, but I'll just reinforce some info there. Um, I was asked to talk about my pathway into policy, and so I'm gonna be as comfortable as I can talking about uh, myself to you all, but hopefully it invites um, some questions and some inquiry and maybe even a little bit of excitement and inspiration as you think about your own pathways into policy. Um, we're gonna dig into the Farm Bill, little Farm Bill 101. The folks who are enrolled in the seminar, you know, feel free to confer with your neighbor if they have questions or uh, pull from your reserves uh, from what we've learned about so far. And then we'll close out um, with some discussion between Dr. Madsen and myself. So uh, at Berkeley Food Institute, our mission is to transform food systems, expand access to healthy foods, promote sustainable and equitable food production. And we also invest deeply in leadership development, especially through students like you all, to support and maintain diverse, just, and resilient and healthy food systems. BFI started off as an interdisciplinary hub with accountability and partnerships built across multiple departments, including the schools of public health, public policy, journalism, law, and a lot more. We also do work at the local, state, and federal levels with different partners. We participate in research and working groups across different issue areas that pertain to the Institute. We support farmers and farm workers through our advocacy and bringing students to learn from farmers on um, their properties and much more. The four pillars of our work are good food access, rural and urban agroecology, fair and healthy jobs, and racial equity. Across these different areas, some of the projects that I'm currently working on or that we've worked on historically include the Farm to School Incubator Grant Evaluation Team, which is a statewide project evaluating the impacts of the Farm to School program, 
There were two new tracks that were developed recently to examine the impacts and motivations of farmers who prioritize climate smart agriculture practices or participating in the program and also looking at farm to school programs for early childhood, um, childhood education centers. Um, under our rural and urban agroecology work, we've done a lot of work around soil health and water policy. One of our recent publications was actually worked on by a graduate student at the public policy school last year that, fo that focused on um, the experiences of Punjabi farmers participating in the Healthy Soils Program in the Central Valley, which was novel and garnered a lot of attention and attraction to that particular area of our work. Under Fair and Healthy Jobs, we produced a report at the height of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic looking at the impact of the pandemic on gig economy workers, especially those who work for large companies that we can think of, and also the experiences of grocery workers and stores who we're helping all of us to shelter in place by having our groceries delivered and thinking about the different systems that might have impacted those workers disproportionately, especially in the state of California. And also related to our racial equity work, one of the big events that I'm in the process of uh, planning in partnership with other folks in DC is our Farm Bill Summit focused on pointing the Farm Bill towards racial justice and thinking about racial equity and repair and how the Farm Bill this year can be a policy vehicle for actualizing some of those things. There's a lot of opportunities for student engagement. Um, we have student employees, which I think is really exciting. It's always good to be able to support yourself as a student. Um, can I see a show of hands of people who are enrolled in the graduate certificate uh, for food systems? I thought I would see more. We need more folks in the, enrolled in that. Dr. Madsen teaches the primary course for that, right? The Transforming Food Systems course. Um, that's housed at uh, BFI, but it's really important for our undergraduate students. There's also the food systems minor. We host conferences, workshops, farm tours. We have student club funding available for folks that want to submit a request for that. We also have our food systems opportunity newsletter, which goes out every week. And there are opportunities for employment and for other things in the Berkeley area or beyond that students can tap into. Also teaching, which is part of my, my plate for this particular semester. And with all of these things and many more that I'm gonna talk about, you can just go to food.berkeley.edu and it will take you to our website. There are two big events that I wanna bring your attention to before I dive into talking about my pathway into policy. On Friday, March 17th from two to 5 p.m. in the Martin Luther King Jr. Student Union, we are hosting a food systems career fair where students will have the opportunity to talk to employers. Well, I'm not sure if we're gonna have the resume and cover letter reviewing incorporated into that, but if nothing else, come to meet folks who have been businesses within the food system that might be of interest to you, either for full-time opportunities, internship opportunities, um, or maybe even capstone projects, if that's a requirement for the program that you're in. And there's also a registration link for that on our website. And then on April 7th through the 8th, the Food Institute Grad Council, also known as FIGC, is hosting the Food Futures Conference. And the first day is virtual, second day is in person, and that will be in Anthony Hall on campus. And like many of those things, just go to our website and you can find more information there. So, um, I was really happy when I was invited to, to class um, to talk about my pathway into policy. Um, I don't think I had a very conventional route, maybe sort of, kind of. I spent a lot of time living in Washington, D.C., going to college in D.C., but uh, when I was done with college, I was very eager to get out of the District of Columbia because it felt a little stifling, and I just was genuinely confused and really not sure what I wanted to do. And I would say that the pathway that I was on was confusing and challenging at times, but sometimes also very engaging and high energy and really collaborative and just very motivating for myself. And I think along the way, I was always really privileged to have really great mentors in my life who were encouraging, um, who spoke positively in rooms that I was not in, who made opportunities available to me um, and also challenged me when they observed me thinking in narrow ways or in ways that could have been more expansive. And I can't um, overstate how important that is as a young person when you're really just trying to, trying to decipher and figure out what you want to do with your like 40 hour work week or however long you um, anticipate working. 
And for undergrad, I was at Georgetown in DC, a little place on a hilltop. And I was like, is there a Hoya in here? Wait a minute. Hello, Hoya Saxa, yes. Um, I was like a very disgruntled pre-med student. I used all of my elective classes to take like physics and calculus and it tanked my GPA. It was not pretty. Um, I was also a philosophy major, which was kind of confusing at the time, but I think the philosophy major is more applicable now than ever, if anything, with knowing how to ask the right questions and think about model cities and thinking about what we should do with our time and how we ought to relate to each other. Um, I was also the first in my family to get a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. And being the first in my family to go to college, um, the challenge of that cannot be overstated either. And I think for anyone who has had that experience or something parallel to that, you know how challenging that can be to want to center your passion, to want to think about how you want to spend your time while also having competing priorities related to being able to take care of yourself and make an income and to support yourself and maybe your family on top of that or other priorities. When I think about my pathway into policy, um, it starts in Seattle. I was a City Year AmeriCorps member. Is anybody familiar with AmeriCorps? Yes, a uh, very bright red uniform that I just, it made me not want to wear the color red for a very long time. Um, but it was a really important time in my life and I tutored in fifth grade math and science and the school that I worked at had a food pantry and a weekend backpack program in partnership with a local food bank to send kids home on the weekend with supplementary foods for them and their families. And I found myself far more interested in wanting to you know, participate in those wraparound services rather than doing the tutoring that I was doing. Even though the, the students were wonderful and their test scores went up, I was like, wow, I didn't know schools could also play that particular social function for our students. And across these you know, timeline here, I really tried to articulate the work functions that I gathered from doing that. So a lot of direct service, a lot of community engagement, a lot of program management, legislative advocacy, and so on and so forth. And when I left the congressional, when I left um, Seattle, I went on to do a fellowship with the Congressional Hunger, uh, congressional hunger Center in DC, the Emerson National Hunger Fellows Program. And I did my field work in New Orleans, Louisiana with the Jesuit Social Research Institute at Loyola University where I was studying the impacts of SNAP on the state of Louisiana and really looking at what it meant to families who were income insecure and food insecure to have that supplementary uh, benefit. For my policy placement, I was with the National Conference of State Legislatures in supporting their bipartisan hunger partnership which brought members of different state legislatures from across the aisle to talk about school breakfast programs and school lunch programs and really important model legislation that they could take back to their respective um, capitals that they could implement. And it was just like really good policy in action and I got to help coordinate a lot of site visits and stuff like that. And I, I really enjoyed it and I decided to stay in DC and I worked for a group called DC Hunger Solutions which involved a lot of direct outreach and application assistance for people seeking to enroll into the SNAP program or in California, as we call it, CalFresh. And that work was supported by the Department of Human Services with an outreach grant from the USDA Food and Nutrition Services. And that was really challenging, partly because at the time, DC didn't even have an, a, an electronic system to apply for benefits online. Everything was on paper. And a lot of the clients that I worked with would lose paperwork or DHS would lose paperwork. And that was the reason why somebody didn't have these really crucial benefits that were needed to get food for themselves and for their families. And that really, really frustrated me. And direct service is just really hard. It's very respectable. And I think it got me where I am today, but it is not um, for the faint of heart. And after that, I ended up going back to the Congressional Hunger Center to help run the Emerson National Hunger Fellows Program I did a lot of recruitment, selections, onboarding, offboarding, career advising, managing field and policy site partnerships, and helping to build out graduate school partnerships for the fellows that were in our program and also for alums. And I was like, I kind of want to go back to grad school myself. So that was when I uh, ultimately decided to apply to GSPP, the Goldman School of Public Policy here at Berkeley. And that was probably one of the best decisions I could have made in the pandemic. I had applied to school in 2019 and then, you know, we all know how 2020 went. So I was ready to go back to school. I was ready to learn more. And when I got to Berkeley, that's when I started working at BFI. I started off on their policy team right when I started graduate school. 
and did a lot of research, a lot of writing and educational advocacy around the issues that I articulated a, a, a few slides before this. But while I was at Goldman, I also had an internship with the Legislative Analyst Office in Sacramento on their State Budget Condition Unit, which was really important for examining state and federal COVID funding dollars that were coming to California and trying to make sense of how much money was actually available and being spent and allocated across many different policy areas in the state. And for my capstone project, or at GSPP as we call it, our APA, or Advanced Policy Analysis Project, I was with the city and county of San Francisco Human Services Agency examining experiences of food insecurity for people living in single room occupancy hotels or SRO hotels, which notoriously don't have access to adequate kitchen space and are the size of a dormitory where oftentimes uh, family units with multiple people are living in them. And so that was a really important experience and um, policy learning experience for me that ultimately led to some recommendations for the agency. And after I graduated from GSPP, I spent the summer teaching. I did an intro to policy analysis course for the PPIA uh, Junior Summer Institute, and that was a lot of fun working with undergrads. And then I started at BFI full time in August 2022, where I now lead our state legislative and federal engagement. I get to share a lot of the work of our really stellar uh, faculty directors and affiliate faculty with members of the legislature for educational purposes. I'm teaching this semester and also participating in some of our research and evaluation projects. And so one of the things that I really um, noticed early on in my career doing a lot of anti-hunger and anti-poverty work was that a lot of advocates were concerned with increasing access to food and improving people's livelihoods, but either didn't know as much or didn't care as much about how food was made or who was producing the food or the conditions under which those foods were being produced. And at the same time, I also had friends and colleagues who were deeply involved in farming, who were deeply involved in agriculture and climate change work, but likely had never spent any time in a food bank or at a food pantry or didn't really know the contours or challenges of applying for public benefits and weren't as moved by the familiar shame and political attacks that are often levied against poor people. And I found it intellectually satisfying to be able to focus on both of those things, to do anti-hunger work and anti-poverty work and food systems issues. And I wanted to make sure that whatever policy work I was doing acknowledged the interconnectedness of those issues and allowed me to whatever extent possible to focus on that. And I was really fortunate that BFI was sort of my, my intellectual and policy home to be able to do those things. And before I transition to talking about the farm bill, I really think it's important to impart that anti-hunger advocates can also be food systems advocates and food systems advocates can also care deeply about food access and issues of economic insecurity and poverty because those things are all interconnected and I think it feels a little bit better when I can acknowledge that and work at the intersections of that work. And so if this resonates with you, then I, that's, that's awesome. But I, it took me a while to sort of realize that there was a gap in my learning and in my experience that I really wanted to bridge. I'm gonna pivot now to talking about the Farm Bill. I think you all have some exposure to this, if only by name, if you just like know the name of the Farm Bill, like that's fine. Um, but in essence, it's an omnibus package of bills comprised of what are called marker bills. And there are 12 titles. And the current farm bill is set to expire, expire at the end of the federal fiscal year on September 30th. We're not going to get into what happens if the farm bill <laughs> doesn't pass. Um, just very briefly, uh, if Congress can't get it together by this date, they have the option of introducing what's called the continuing resolution so that programs that are funded under the Farm Bill work, will continue. But beyond that, it's kind of a little bit of a, a policy black box. Um, if you're in my class, we've talked about it a little bit. Um, but hopefully, maybe, fingers crossed, Congress will give us a new, a new Farm Bill by this time. It's a Farm Bill year. <laughs> it's kind of like the Super Bowl of like food and ag policy. <laughs> to me, at least, I think. It's just, if it resonates, you know, just, yeah, just stick with me. Um, there are 12 titles, and I want to draw your attention to a few to point out some of the important programs that are authorized through these titles. Title four is nutrition, and it funds SNAP, CalFresh, 
the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program that is operational in every state and in several uh, territories of the United States and is the biggest funding source um, coming out of the Farm Bill, which we'll talk a little bit about in the next slide. Title VI, Rural Development, supports community and economic development in rural areas across the country, including the development of rural housing. Title VII, um, Research and Related Matters, I think that's kind of a funny title, um, authorizes funding uh, for programmatic efforts for agricultural extension programs like UC a &R, the UC Agriculture and Natural Resources Extension Program. They run both, uh, both strategic initiatives and research centers where they partner with farmers on demonstration projects and much more. Title 12 is also very important and funds programs for first time farmers and ranchers, socially, disadvantage, socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers, despite the uh, title name being miscellaneous, a lot is under that particular uh, title. I think it's also important to dig into what the Farm Bill doesn't cover. Um, it doesn't cover crucial child nutrition programs like WIC and the National School Meals Program. That is covered under the Child Nutrition Reauthorization Act, which has not been reauthorized fully in more than, more than a decade versus the Farm Bill, which is reauthorized every five years. The Farm Bill also doesn't cover farm labor, public land grazing, like with these sheets and things, and a lot of other issues like water and uh, the Food and Drug Administration. One of the challenges in getting the Farm Bill passed, or really any bill in Congress, is the fiscal tag associated with that bill and the costs associated with funding it. In 2018, the Congressional Budget Office estimated that the Agricultural Improvement Act of 2018, which was the last farm bill, will cost nearly $428 billion over five years. And as you can see, 76% of those funds went to the nutrition title and other areas were crop insurance, commodities, and conservation programs. During the last few farm bill cycles, lawmakers have critiqued um, the nutrition title receiving the bulk of the funding in this particular bill. And it's already coming up again in this particular 2023 farm bill reauthorization process, especially due to the budget deficit in Congress and sweeping cuts that are anticipated across many, many program areas. And uh, that is something that advocates are paying a lot of attention to. Members of Congress obviously have to pay attention to that. Um, and I think for every farm bill cycle, a lot of bipartisan good policy work has identified that the nutrition title needs to stay in the farm bill. On top of that, it's acknowledging the interconnectedness that farmers are producing fruits and vegetables and other goods that SNAP participants are buying in grocery stores or from farmers markets or from other authorized uh, SNAP retailers. And so these things are not as disconnected as some policymakers would make them out to be, even though this is a very significant size of the budget that's going to this crucial program that's fighting food insecurity across the country. I thought it would also be pertinent to describe the process undertaken to reauthorize the Farm Bill. If you are in the class, you have seen this. So um, this is a really uh, stellar graphic that was produced by the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition, or NSAC, of which BFI is a coalition member. They represent a lot of different grassroots organizations across the country in DC, especially those um, that maybe don't have as much policy capacity and especially during farm bill years like we are in now. So just we're going to work our way from the top all the way down to the bottom for this. And so for each chamber of Congress, they have their respective agriculture committees. You have the House Ag Committee and you have the Senate Ag Committee. At the start of what is now the 118th Congress, each committee must get to work producing their own farm bill. That process can take months, and once a version of a farm bill is produced by the respective chamber, it's taken to the chamber floor to be voted on by all members of the House or of the Senate. This is a time when the bill is amended, when marker bills are up for consideration. For example, a marker bill might be introduced that is supporting funding for local processing efforts for regional food systems. And so that bill will be introduced into Congress, but it's not introduced with the intent of actually being made into a law by itself. It's introduced with the intent of being included in the larger farm bill. So if you go to like congress.gov, 
and look up a bill, it'll just say introduced. You might not think any traction is happening on it, but it's to garner attention and support within that respective party to make sure that it's included in the farm bill. From there, um, once respective chambers make changes to the bill themselves, key members, oh no, sorry, I think I'm one behind. That process can take a couple of months. And so at the start of what's now the 180th Congress, each committee must get to work producing that. That process can take a couple of months. And once a version of the Farm Bill is introduced, taken to the floor, this is when it's amended by marker bills. And from here, key members from the House Ag Committee and Senate Ag Committee meet for what's called a conference committee to reconcile their respective versions of the Farm Bill from the House and one from the Senate. And once they do that, if they can come to agreement, they then return to their own chambers in the House and in the Senate to have a full floor vote on that reconciled version of the bill. In an ideal situation, they can take this bill, it's reconciled, they'll vote on it, and then once it's passed, it's sent to the president to be signed into law. But we know that policy and politics are much more messy than this. And again, it's an ideal situation. The process is iterative and also depending on the competing priorities of Congress. And right now, some of those competing priorities are the budget deficit. So there's not going to be a lot of agreement on how programs should be funded, at what level they should be funded, or if they should even be reauthorized altogether. And so that is the policy environment that we're working under right now. Other issues include the fact that the COVID-19 pandemic and other budget bills that have been passed made supplementary funding available to programs that are already typically funded by the Farm Bill. And some members of Congress are proposing less money because of the influx of dollars that were made available in previous months. We'll see what happens. You can follow along on Politico, on Morning Ag, on the Hagstrom Report, Civil Eats. A lot of major publications are following along with this. I now wanted to give some of our attention to the key California players who are responsible for shaping the Farm Bill. We don't have enough time to dive into uh, each house and um, who's part of each uh, ag committee, but after the 22 midterm elections, what you really should pay attention to is the fact that the House of Representatives is now led by Republican leadership while the Senate remains under Democratic leadership. This means that the House Agriculture Committee is also under Republican leadership, being led by Congressman G.T. Thompson of Pennsylvania. The Senate Agriculture Committee is being led by Senator Debbie Stabenow of Michigan. And it was also announced in early January that Senator Stabenow is retiring. And so that implies that some change will come to the Senate Ag Committee during the next election cycle but that doesn't necessarily imply a leadership change. That is gonna be dependent on the overall outcome of the election. On the left-hand side, we have four members of Congress, Representatives LaMalfa, Costa, Duarte, and Carbajal. And these are all of the California members who are part of the House Agriculture Committee. LaMalfa and Duarte are members of the ranking party. And so their um, policy and preference would take more precedent given that change in political leadership in the House. On the right, we have Congresswoman Barbara Lee, who represents Berkeley in a lot of parts, lot of, parts of the East Bay. She's the highest ranking African-American woman in Democratic leadership in the House of Representatives. She's also part of the powerful House Appropriations Committee, which oversees all government spending, specifically the Subcommittee on Agriculture, Rural Development, and Food and Drug Administration, and other related agencies. Senator Dianne Feinstein, who also announced that they are not running for re-election and is retiring from Congress, um, is part of the Senate Appropriations Committee, which also covers agriculture, rural development, food and drug administration, and other related agencies. So you all know what the Farm Bill is now. You have a sense of how much it costs, if you can remember the chart, how it's authorized, and the key congressional players from California who will shape and ultimately fund the bill. I wanna close out my time um, talking a little bit about how BFI engages in the farm bill, how we did that in 2018, and how we're doing that now with the 2023 farm bill reauthorization process. Um, this is the class, this is untangling the farm bill. This is the, the class flyer, <laughs> flyer that went out for this. 
Um, and each week we dive into a different title of the Farm Bill and typically have a speaker come to talk about their work um, with the organization that they're part of in the food and agriculture space, how it ties back to the Farm Bill and the priorities that they're advocating for during this particular Farm Bill cycle. On the first day of class, we had Congresswoman Barbara Lee stop by and that was kind of iconic and she was already like in the area. Actually, I heard that uh, her office learned that Food Service at um, Farm Service Agency Administrator Zach Ducino was in town, and Congresswoman Lee's office was like, "Well, we'd like to come and see him. Where can we see him?" And it just all kind of descended on the first day of class, and it was like, "No pressure. Like we have a Congressperson and a Federal Administrator, and I had slides and everything ready for class, and it was just like, nope. Like this is this is our first day of class, and I I, I think it left a, a good impression." Um, but it was really, really wonderful to hear them talk about, um, from the congressional perspective, how the Farm Bill is made, and then from the USDA perspective, ultimately how it's implemented. And so I thought that dual perspective was a really unique one to be able to offer on the first day of class. Um, in 2017, BFI hosted Farm Bill 2018 Policy, Politics, and Potential, which was a summit in Washington, D.C. that was hosted in partnership with American University. And I'm so excited that we're doing it again this year. Um, this is the screenshot of the application portal that's available to students uh, to participate in the 2023 Farm Bill Summit with us that we're hosting. Um, I think it's also really important to share that at BFI we can't lobby because we're part of a state institution, but our greatest strengths pertain to working with UC Berkeley students and faculty, doing research, and educating the public about food systems issues, especially public officials and elected officials, and working in coalition with other groups on important food systems issues. And that Farm Bill Summit allowed us to do that, and we're so excited that we get to do it again this year at the end of the semester. It's scheduled to be from April 30th to May 2nd, which is like right in between the end of the semester and the start of the RRR week. And I really wanted to highlight as well that one of the partners that we're working with this year is the Federation of Southern Cooperatives slash land assistance fund. They're one of the oldest black led cooperative groups in the country serving black farmers, landowners, and other low income people in the south and south, southeastern regions of the US on cooperative development, land retention, and advocacy during farm bill years and also outside of farm bill years. The FSC also played a crucial role in highlighting issues related to black farmers in the US. And we're also instrumental in getting the Justice for Black Farmers Act introduced in the House and Senate in 2021, which was just reintroduced by Senator Cory Booker and hopefully will be incorporated into the Farm Bill this year. It's also, um, I'm sorry, the Farm Bill uh, title this year is Pointing the Farm Bill Towards Racial Justice to emphasize the importance of an opportunity for this Farm Bill to be a policy vehicle for advancing racial equity and repair across all 12 titles. It's also an opportunity to center climate smart agriculture and climate resilience, and always to center farmers, ranchers, and producers, especially those who have experienced systemic discrimination by the USDA or the US Department of Agriculture. And so I'm really excited about this. Um, like everything else, I didn't put a link for our website, but food.berkeley.edu, the application is the first thing you'll see if you go to the website. And we have full funding for five graduate students to come with us. And the application is open until March 21st. Should probably take like 20 minutes to complete depending on how thoughtful or robust you want to respond to the uh, questions that are on there. And um, I'm really looking forward to that um, as we near the end of the semester. And I also just wanted to highlight that we are hiring for an agroecology and wellness coordinator, a full-time position on our staff, and this person gets to work uh, really closely with students, especially folks with Berkeley Student Farms and SOGA. It's a hybrid position, and um, the application will close on the 15th. And thank you for your time. These are our wonderful staff and trips and things, and my contact information is here if you have questions. Um, I have a work Twitter, that's a lot of fun. Um, so follow that if you feel like it. But thank you for your time, and Dr. Madsen, let's have a conversation. Okay, so it looks like we only have time for about one question tonight. Awesome. So, who? 
going to be the lucky winner for the open? question. Oh, oh gosh, I thought it was 8 o'clock. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. All right, well, I'm, I, we may be able to sneak in one student question as well, but what I really want, this is a lot for you to take in, I know, but if you could ask them to take one action Ooh. related to the farm bill, I mean, that's, that's not an easy question either, but what's the one thing you would love to see them do related to the farm bill? Um, follow it. Like, subscribe to some newsletters, subscribe to the House Agriculture Committee, the Senate Agriculture Committee, um, follow along with Politico and follow along the members of Congress from California who have a stake in shaping this bill. And to the extent possible, if you're part of any other advocacy groups like INSAC or the California Farmer Justice Collaborative or CAF, the California um, Alliance of Family Farmers, these are all groups on the ground in California who want to, sh who want to see this bill work for um, farmers and ranchers in our state, especially small farmers, BIPOC farmers, first time farmers, young farmers, and um, just folks who have a stake in that. But I think if anything, like set up a Google alert, like follow along, it's really interesting. It's very messy, it's gonna get messy. So if that's of interest to you, like stay up to date and educated on it. No, no students gonna pose a question? I don't mean like, like a threat. Does anybody wanna ask? Okay, I'm gonna, Magic wand, you, you're holding the, you're queen for a day. Oh, you yeah. have a magic wand and you can pass one policy. Like you can make one thing happen. Oh my goodness. Oh man, oh that's so big. I know. Well, I, I'm wondering <laughs> if it would be around racial equity because you didn't even get to go into any details about yeah. how the farm bill can actually affect. And I know Cory Booker had put stuff forward with reparations and mm -hmm. related to, to farming. And so if I had a, an easy wand not in necessarily order of priority, there are so many black farmers who are waiting for money from the USDA, from the Pigford lawsuit that was decades ago, that was a class action lawsuit against the USDA um, for systemic discrimination against black farmers and ranchers who have never, um, I'd say got their day in court or got appropriate financial repair for the losses that they experienced. And it has literally resulted in land loss, farm loss, um, and just being distraught. If I could wave a wand, I would fix that. I would fix that. Um, and also protect SNAP at all costs. Like don't cut the program. And also expand it to include other categories of folks who need access, like college students and people who um, have varying legal statuses um, in the United States, but obviously are here and have families here and who need to feed themselves and feed their families and have been waiting for um, a pathway to citizenship that Congress has still not figured out. And so I would fix uh, funding for, for black farmers and I would protect SNAP at all costs and the conservation program. It's a lot, I have many wands. No, no, I think that, <laughs> and, and we'll send, I'll make sure I'll send yeah. to, to Will, um, I, there's a couple of great articles, one's in the Atlantic, but around, around these issues, specifically related to black farmers and this long history of discrimination and the pending lawsuit. And um, I, I also think, you know, California, interestingly, has obviously the largest population, but we have the lowest percentage enrollment in SNAP among those who are eligible. At least we used yeah. to. We were in like the, t the bottom two for many years. I don't know if that's still, yeah. it's got to still be the case. And I think largely because people are afraid, right? To yeah. sign up. Yeah. It's challenging, especially if you live in a household that's mixed status or with differing legal status. I mean, during the Trump administration, um, what was called the chilling effect of these like leaked, leaked executive memos um, that would have implemented a public charge for people participating in SNAP, which would have made their ability to pursue legal status really precarious. Um, that was really challenging. We saw people unenrolling their children from school breakfast programs and enrolling them, uh, themselves from SNAP. And luckily, President Biden um, said pretty definitively that um, SNAP is not going to be subject to public charge in that way that it was articulated during the Trump administration. But the fear is still there. It's still there. Um, and that is really deleterious to people's ability to take good care of themselves and to feed their, themselves and their families. So that's really hard. Um, 
But yeah, I would just say follow along, y'all. It's really interesting. Like, it really is the Super Bowl of, like, food and ag policy. Um, and then you're going to have to wait, like, another five years. Like, it's happening. Like, what's going to happen? Your year. What's going to happen in five years? Like, where will we even be as a country? I don't know. <laughs> so follow it now. <laughs> be in tune with it now. It's really interesting. And um, I think it really does reflect all of American politics and democracy and, like, this big bill that has to be passed. Otherwise, it will be catastrophic if it doesn't. And we don't want that to happen. It's probably like the cousin of like the government shutdown. Like it's really bad. Like we don't, we don't want that. So but thanks for your attention and your time. Well, thank you so much. Th thank you all. Yes, it was great to be part of this. <laughs>